Hello and welcome to UFC's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden and I'm joined by my partner on the mic, UFC analyst Dan Hardy. Well, it's certainly been a month of surprises in the world of mixed martial arts and UFC 206 is proving no difference. Injury to DC forced the light heavyweight king out of the main event, meaning Rumble Johnson will have to wait for his crack at the crown. However, an already fascinating matchup between Max Holloway and former lightweight champion Anthony Pettis at featherweight now takes on huge significance. With Joe Senaldo promoted to undisputed featherweight champion, Holloway and Pettis now main events in Toronto for the interim featherweight title. Hawaii native Holloway hasn't tasted defeat in the octagon since being the only fighter to take Conor McGregor the distance during the Irish superstar's run to the featherweight title back in 2013. Meanwhile, Pettis has already had a UFC belt around his waist and must surely relish the chance to join the illustrious group of two weight UFC champions. OK, well, let's take a look at this new main event then for UFC 206. Daniel Cormier, we hope you get well soon. That is a great shame that that fight fell out. But what a tantalising one we have now. The former WEC and UFC lightweight champion, Anthony Pettis, making his second only appearance at featherweight. I actually caught up with him at UFC 205. Told me he never used to cut weight, really, at lightweight. And, in fact, that was his test cut right. in his debut. So should have this figured out a little bit more, but the challenge of five rounds is something that I think us fans are considering for him. Yeah, well, you know, the additional 10 minutes is a big ask when you've not been preparing for it, but we have to remember Pettis, well, one, he's never been stopped, which means he's done a few five rounders. Yes. And two, you know, he's been a champion before, so he's, he's familiar with how to pace himself over a five round fight and, you know, conserve energy when he needs it. Also very good at finding rest in the octagon when other people would feel under pressure. So his experience will pay off here for sure. What about this young man who has been on a real tear? He looks absolutely amazing. And, you know, since that fight against McGregor, which even if we go back and look at the fight against McGregor, it doesn't look like Max Holloway anymore. He looks like a very different fighter now. Keeps making jumps. Every time, every time we see him, because he's, I mean, he's 24 years old, he joined the UFC <laughs> very early. Yeah. And he's on, what, a nine-fight win streak at the moment. And he's just rolling through guys. Yeah. He looks better every time he fights. And the competition's getting, getting better every time. So you would expect, even if his level stayed the same and the competition got better, we'd still be impressed. But he's getting better against better opponents. Yeah. So really, the sky's the limit. OK. One thing that I wanted to just point out, with tied most knockdowns in UFC featherweight history, I never thought that no, about I Max Holloway, but it's, it's a really nice stat. Amongst all the other guys there, he's, he's right up there. Yeah. So I like this matchup. Um, Holloway said that the waters were murky, and now he has clarity, which I think is important for these guys who felt like they were being stalled a little bit. But yeah. now Joe Seauda has become the undisputed champion. And by the way, Holloway doesn't have nice things to say about him. <laughs> but this matchup, particularly with Pettis, is they, they are singing off the same hymn sheet. They both really like the matchup. It sounds very sporting, yep. it's very competitive, and they're, they're looking forward to putting on a fantastic main event at 2.06. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, no doubt. And, it, and it's got to change the mindset of Max Holloway as well. Well, I mean, both of these guys, but particularly Max Holloway, who's never had his hands on that UFC gold. You know, He's he, hungry, for oh, sure. Oh, for sure. He was training for a three-round co-main event against Pettis, and now he's fighting five rounds for the UFC gold. I mean, if he wins it, he will have a belt around his waist. Yeah. And he knows he's got the next shot at Aldo. That is, that's the golden ticket. That's not a golden belt. That's his opportunity to fight the champion. And, you know... After all the confusion with McGregor holding the belt and then being in different weight classes and stuff, it's been frustrating for these guys not, not seeing that path to the title, as, as he referred to it as blasphemy and malarkiness, which is <laughs> typical Max Holloway uh, lyrics. Um, this is a, a really interesting position because he now knows he's got a clear path to the belt and, he, and he's, you know, the win streak he's on proves he's deserving of it. And obviously Pettis is the perfect person to test him. Yeah, and just a note about Pettis then before we take a look at Max Holloway second appearance in the division. Yeah. <laughs> and once again, he could be one of the very few, I think, would he be the fifth that would then get gold around his way across the yeah. world? Yeah, I mean, he joins the likes of BJ Penn, Randy Couture, and you know, the greats of all time. Oh, unbelievable stuff. Yeah. So, a lot to play for. Definitely. Let's take a look at Holloway. OK, Max Holloway, the first thing we have to speak about is his striking. And as I said, he gets better from one fight to another. 
He's, he's very creative, he's comfortable switching stances, he's, he's good at throwing unusual things in as well. And watch this switch stance here, he switches once, twice, and then finishes with a spinning back fist, and then throws Cole Miller to the floor. So not only is he a very technical fighter, but he's also got that scrapping attitude. You know, he likes to pressure people with unusual shots and keep a high volume of strikes on them. Another thing that is going to be interesting to see how he matches up with Pettis is how he strikes on an unusual timing. Look how he leaps in there and then stays in range to throw a second right hand. Again here, watch this. He steps into a southpaw stance and throws two beautiful hooks to the body. Just stuff that you don't expect coming. It's not a, it's not a classical approach to striking. But then when he, rhythm still. Very much so. But when he finds his rhythm, when he, when he gets in one of these flows, oh. he's very dangerous. You know, he throws five, six, eight, ten strike combinations, and then he'll throw something like that on the end of it, which can always catch somebody by surprise. And, and Lamas is no joke. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's one of the top five and, and has been for a long time. So for Holloway to come in and to do this, to let's go, you know, this is the last ten seconds of the last round. And even in this trade here, he's got head movement, he's rolling, he's well balanced on his feet, and he's picking his shots. You know, he's an exciting young man, he's tenacious, and he's confident in his hands and his chin, which makes this a, an intriguing matchup with Pettis because he's going to have to step into that range against Pettis if he's going to put pressure on him. Yeah, OK, well, this matchup has attracted the attention of you good folk at home. So thank you very much for sending your questions in via Twitter. And let's, uh, oh, I think I recognise, I think I recognise this one, Dan. Gorgeous <laughs> George. Thank you for reaching out, sir. So, what have you said? Did Pettis' kick do him some harm? Fans now expect a highlight. Perhaps he strays away from the game plan. I guess that's referring to the Showtime kick. I mean, yeah. he climbed the wall like a ninja. Yes, yeah, we, we've seen that kick, well, as many times as we've seen the spinning head kick we get with Barbosa, you know what I mean? It's one of those real iconic moments where, where one of these fighters just, you know, in such a high-pressure situation, steps outside of their comfort zone, takes a chance, and it pays off. And it was a, it was a great knockdown of Ben Henderson yeah. uh, at the time and, you know, and, and has been echoed in every highlight reel since. The problem is, yes, he, does, he has kind of fell victim to that because now we expect that. It's like the Uriah Hall type of syndrome. When we see a, a dynamic, you know, spectacular kick, we expect greatness in every fight. And that really, in, in some way, detracts from the skills and, the, and, the, and the, the technical ability of Anthony Pettis because he's not just this crazy, dynamic, flashy kicker. He's got a very disciplined striking game. He comes from Taekwondo, and you'll notice he's got quite a long stance and he's got quite lively, good footwork, which is typical of, an, of the Olympic-style Taekwondo. Moving in and out, changing his angle, which was a problem for Barbosa, who's a very technical Muay Thai fighter. Now, against Ben Henderson, who, who was a great champion in his own right, he started to hammer him with these low kicks, and as soon as he saw the registration on, on Ben Henderson's face that that hurt, he continued. Ben Henderson tries to level change, and again, he's, he's creating distance. He's good at keeping that space. This is something else I want to talk about. Oliveira cracks him here with an, with an inside low kick to the, to the thigh. But instead of, instead of wasting that momentum, because what would normally happen, he would normally flare his leg out to the side and squeeze you up so you're open, you're, you're vulnerable to your opponent. But he actually uses this momentum beautifully. He gets hit with the inside leg, he steps across, and then comes straight up with the head kick, which, it, well, it's, it's, just a, it's just a really good use of momentum because most people wouldn't be expecting that shift. And you can see how open and flexible his hips are, which allows him to get away with this kind of stuff. And it must be instinctive as well because you don't know how hard that leg kick's coming and how, how wide your base is going to be set. No. So he's felt that in a blink of an eye and been able to respond. That's it. And again, it's that creativity, that on-the-spot improvisation where he can find these opportunities. And, you know, Olivier was never expecting that. But then, you know, we, we, go, into the, we go into the more, um, the more disciplined, the more calculated approach, and then we talk about the Cerrone fight. And Cerrone had worked his way up to a title shot, and, and more deserving than anybody in the division, probably ever, for a title shot. But again, fell, fell victim to body shots early in the fight. And I want to show you something here. I'm just rewinding it because I want to pull back to this particular point where Cowboy gets hit with the first body shot that hurts him. Now, he hides it very well. He's got a great poker face, but there are some tells which I want to point out to you here. And some of these are things that I think you can only see if you've been in there a few times and you've A, taken a few body shots, which are awful, mm -hmm. and B, landed a few and, and seen a guy that's trying to hide the fact the that he can't breathe. Yeah. yeah. So this is the first shot. Now, Pettis is going to thunder his shin into the, into the midsection of Cowboy. So here it comes here. 
There's the kick to the midsection. Now, immediately, there's an expression change on Cowboy's face. He's uncomfortable there. He's hiding it well, but you'll see his posture changes. You'll see his midsection buckles and his, exactly, yeah. his elbows come into his side. And the one other thing I want to point out, if I can just find the right shot, there it is. That, ladies and gentlemen, just there, is called the carotid artery. Now, the only way that that pops up like that is if somebody's going, <laughs> if, they can't, if they can't breathe, right? Yeah. You know, watch Joe Rogan when he's, when he's commentating. You'll get the same <laughs> thing going on because he gets so excited. It's the, <gasps> he's holding his breath because he's really trying to express what he's saying. In this situation, Cowboy's diaphragm has no idea what's going yeah, on. It's completely He doesn't know whether yeah. he's in his lungs or, or there isn't. And Cowboy can tell you that there isn't. He can't breathe at this point. He's hiding it very well, like I said. He's got a great poker face. But I guarantee that Pettis recognises this straight away. You can see, like, he dialed in. Like, here he? we go, here we yeah. go. So then the, the onslaught comes. And again, he's, he's struggling to breathe here. He can't breathe. It's an awful place to be. So Petty starts to invest. Watch this jump off the fence there. Beautiful knee. But then goes straight back to the body kick. And this next one that he lands folds, folds in like a deck chair. There's nothing he, he could do shot. there. It was awful. It's a horrible kick. Again, here. The disciplined striking of Pettis, which, which doesn't get enough credit. And I think, I think some people would have missed this as well. Um, Joe Lozon certainly did. He certainly didn't see it coming. Because what happens here is Pettis uses uh, two, two striking combinations to program Lozon here. Then he follows it up with a feint just to check that Lozon's bought the game that he's selling him. And then he sets him up with the head kick. So let me talk you through this. The first thing that's going to happen is Pettis is going to step forward. He's going to throw... Uh, I think it's a three or four strike combination focusing on the left hand. So he's going to throw it twice in the, in the first combination and three times in the second combination. All he's trying to do, and you'll see that there's no commitment to these shots, what he's trying to do is get Lozon's focus here in this little circle in front of his head. Right. So he's not thinking about anything else. He's focusing on the hands coming to his face. So watch, I'm going to play through it slow so you can see it clearly. So Petty steps in, one, two, there's two left hands there. Yes, the next combination, we're going to go one, hang on, two, breaks away, throws one more. Again, just reaching out, not even turning his body into it, not committing to these shots because he's trying to get the reaction that he wants from Lozon. Now, takes a little bit of a break, throws a nice chop sidekick, but then he's going to throw the same punch again just to check the reaction time of Lozon. So here it goes. He's going to throw his left hand out, and you're going to see the reaction from Lozon. There it is. You can see the, the, the right hand of Lozon, which is a little blurred, but I'm going to circle it anyway. It's just there. So you can see as the, as the left hand comes out, Lozon reaches out to catch it, to parry it. There was, he never wanted to land that. Never wants to land. Look how far away he is. Yeah. Even if he's fully extended, yeah. even if he turned, he's still going to fall a couple of inches short. So his intention was never there to throw that, but what it does do is open up this. I'll just play it full speed so you can see it. What, what I want you to watch out for is just before he throws the left kick, he throws his left hand out, so he goes hand kick. And it's just enough to get the reaction that he wants. There it is. Oh, it's man. beautiful. Watch the slow-mo replay. The left hand comes out, lows on reacts, the hand fires forward and opens up... Ooh, back off the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> It's He's just, risen again. Exactly. It's just enough to get the reaction that he wants. Here we go. Left hand of Pettis comes out. Right hand of, of Lozon reaches forward. There it is, dropping down. There's the window of opportunity. Uh-oh. He knows. You know exactly what's coming. Yeah. Bang. Right in the side of his oh. head. It was perfect. It, it's, it's beautiful. And, and although I like those opportunistic, crazy spinning kicks, I like to see a fighter that is able to program their opponent. Calculate Exactly. Lay traps for them. Make them walk into the shin that you want them to. And that's exactly what Pettis did. And it shows how high level of a striker he is. Yeah. But he can still do the crazy stuff. I think it's the Barboza yeah. fight. The last five, ten seconds of two rounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All he the was spinning doing and, yeah. 360 in various different <laughs> forms. Uh, and it's, it's great to see. It is. Um, because of the nature of this, we have more questions. Okay. So, uh, so let's see. A lot of people interested in this. A lot one. of people. Uh, well, I went bottom right, so let's go top left and check out what Eric has said. Thank you, Eric. Thank 
you. Both fighters seem so well-rounded, and on the feet, both are very dangerous. Who has the advantage on the ground? Well, I think for the mixed martial arts game, we have two very dynamic grapplers. Yeah. Uh, I looked at the stats. I think that Pettis has worked a little bit longer off of his back, remembering some of his submissions that he's thrown up off of his back. But Holloway's very good in that top position as well. So they slightly different games perhaps, but dynamic nonetheless. Yeah. Well, I think it's fair to say that Pettis is slightly more proven on the ground. We, we've seen him finish by submissions over high-level black belts. And that's maybe because of the type of opponents that he's faced. Definitely, definitely. It, it's, it's a combination of their whole mixed martial arts game. And, and as I said with, that, with Holloway, he's constantly evolving. There are always things he's improving upon. So there is not an area of, game, of his game in which we can count out. And the thing I like about his, his takedown defense is it becomes an attack. So the first thing we're gonna see is a takedown sprawl against, against Lamas, which lands him in a good position and immediately starts to think about the attack. The second time here, he wraps the neck and watch Lamas try and bail out, and Holloway clamps down on him. Same thing happens here, where he defends the single leg, good balance here, good hand fighting, he limp legs out, and then he's immediately on the attack, but then switches to the neck, and you'll see Lamas try and bail out one more time and get folded up against the fence. And against Jeremy Stevens, again, taking down a big fighter, a big, big strong lightweight that came down to featherweight. Yeah, good points. Yeah, and watch how he ties him up here. So, this, you know this is one of my favorite positions, John. I love to see this control. The wrist control? It's, it's really dominant. So you can see it, and I'm just gonna let it play on a little more. And you've got to think Stevens is a, well, he was a big, strong lightweight. So then when you move him down to featherweight, you would imagine he's gonna have a strength advantage over most of these guys. But what Holloway does is he's able to control him on the floor, he uses head position to create spaces, to strip this grip. You can see Jeremy Stevens has got one line of defense here, so he's trying to control that wrist because yeah. he knows that he's vulnerable. And, and Holloway uses his head to create space, he strips the grip off, pulls his hand away and continues to strike. And the reason that he's able to do this is because he has the bottom arm, we're gonna see it in a second, he has the bottom arm of Stevens controlled. There it is. There it is. So he's weaved that round. He's gone round his back, and he's controlling that hand, just th that, that wrist just, just there. Crook on the elbow. So there's yeah. nothing that he can do. It's a very, very uh, dominant position. It's something that we see Musasi use a lot. He really likes to strip the grip and tie up the far side wrist so he can make the head vulnerable to strikes. And then from this position, he, he just, he just continued to work. You know, great work from Holloway, good awareness of his positioning on the floor. I like that head position a lot. Yeah, me too. And this is a great finish as well. Look at this. He lands a couple of good body shots on Swanson, great footwork to find his way around him, and then immediately on the offensive on the floor. And as he backs Swanson up again here, he sees the opportunity for the neck, rips a high elbow guillotine and steps straight over to mount. And watch this. Like, he, he, put, he sort of solidifies his position, then slowly works his twist. Now you can see the panic on Cub's face there. It's a black belt. And a, a good black belt and a tough fighter as well. So for him to have found himself in that position where he had to panic tap, that's a, that's a very suffocating position to be in. It shows the kind of squeeze that Holloway can generate, especially when he arches his back into it. Yeah, works with Gracie Technics and really looking forward to seeing how he's developed again. But right. he moves so well for a very tall featherweight fighter. He does. Yeah, in all ranges. Yes. Really good. But... He's up against another dynamic grappler as well. He's, this is what makes this matchup so fascinating. Yeah. They, they work brilliantly in all ranges. It's a true battle of mixed martial artists and two guys that are still developing their game, still young. Pettis, as I said, he's more proven on the ground. We've seen him with some, some really nice submissions, which I'm gonna show you now. So here, you can see him land a couple of good body shots on Oliveira, and Oliveira tries to level change, tries to drag him into his guard. Now, constantly on the offensive, constantly trying to pull him into his guard, reaching for ankles, and watch the footwork. Watch, watch how Pettis steps around, steps away from him. He defends an armbar here, he's very wily, he's very aware of what the dangers are. Look at this, immediately limps out of it, and steps over, finds himself into a good position so he can start striking again. Always on the offensive, which is why I love these fighters, and then in this situation here, he's defending the takedown, he sees the opportunity late in the third round, and it's, it's just, again, opportunistic, but opportunistic because he has the tools to use when the opportunity presents itself. If he didn't have a good guillotine, a great guillotine for, uh, to beat Oliveira, he would have never got that. Again, another high-level black belt. One of my favorite submissions. It's, it's awesome. He isolates the arm perfectly, and then once he's got it locked in, even though Ben Henderson knows exactly what's going on, he's able to adjust it and change it slightly so Ben Henderson's forced to tap. And he didn't even have an arm to, to tap there. It was a verbal submission. 
a very frustrating finish uh, for Ben Henderson because he lost his belt at the same time. But to win by such a spectacular submission like that against a high-level black belt and win the UFC gold at the same time, it really shows how dangerous Pettis is in every range of the game, and that's what we've got to be thinking about in this fight. It is a very dynamic young man, and at, at, at featherweight, it is a very interesting um, addition to the division because he's big, he's strong, he's fast. You know, there isn't really any any area in which a featherweight can beat Anthony Pettis if he's on his game. Yeah. But it's it's all about which one's going to show up and be on their game for this fight. Yeah, and I think he did say that he didn't feel like speed or power had dropped off going to featherweight, which is which is great. One thing I will just ask you about: he's had some issues in his personal life, a terrible thing where uh, there was a fire, I think, on his cars in his yeah. drive, which which happened fairly recently. To me, he seems very professional. Do you think something like that could could wobble you? It was a little earlier on in the camp. Yeah, I don't think so. I think knowing Pettis, I've, I've, I don't know him personally very well, but I've hung out with him a few times, and he just seems like a very mature yeah. young man. He seems to, he seems to be focused on on what he's trying to achieve, and everything else is supplementary. You know, all of his, you know, he likes he likes jewelry and he likes nice clothes and I fast didn't cars. He owns like a couple of gyms oh, himself, yeah. as well as he's got very a share organized. Room. Yeah, very organized young a real man. Real good businessman. I, I just I don't think there's anything that would take his focus away from from his priority, which is always the UFC. And now gold, of course, which is his second opportunity. Added motivation, but yeah. there are there are more fights of at course. UFC. Of course, <laughs> uh, there you go. So for the interim featherweight title, but there's some lovely fights as well. Cerrone Brown oh. will always be be fun. Uh, yeah. Gasolum Kennedy, but what else on there? Well, do you... the the one that stands out. It, this this is I think the fight I'm most excited about on the card, and I, I'm going to talk about it a little bit because we are going to talk about it. I, I love this fight. Partly because Cub Swanson is one of my all-time favourites. I just love his style. He's aggressive, hands down. Everything he throws is big power. And then Duho Choi, we're talking about power. I, I can't think of another person in UFC history that has looked so unassuming yeah. and has had Anthony Johnson power in his hands. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> he just doesn't look like he should be able to generate no. that kind of force. Well, I know that no one's stealing his lunch money. <laughs> uh, that's not happening in the queue. Um, so this fight came about because the Korean superboy, Duho Choi, called out Cub Swanson, but in a quite a polite way. He's yeah. like, I really respect you, I like your game, I, I think that we'll put on a good fight. Could you please ask the matchmakers if, if we could fight one another, which I thought was quite a nice way that it came about. But yeah. he's since gone on and said he's no longer killer Cub. You know, uh, the, the Korean superboy would have dispatched of Cub's last two opponents, and he said he's going to get the knockout in the first. Well, let's just keep that in mind when we analyse yeah. this. Yeah. He doesn't quite make the fight metrics because he hasn't had five UFC fights, but the stats that I've seen of his are just crazy. Mm. I think he's, his strike rate per minute is about seven per minute, yeah. where Conor McGregor's is like five and a half. Yeah. So he's on target for, for really getting up there on the leaderboard with a lot of stuff. Apparently the Conor McGregor of the East, they're <laughs> dubbing him. He's destined for greatness, partly because he's so marketable, because he doesn't look like a fighter, yeah. you know, and, and how he goes about things. And this may seem very strange to some people, to, to ask to fight somebody that you look up to and that you respect. It is kind of a compliment if somebody says, I would like to fight you because I respect you. And that's what's happening here. These two guys are, you know, I mean, Cub Swanson's welcomed plenty of people into the, into the UFC, to the top ranks, and has already always put on a great show. Yeah. But Duho Choi has really taken the UFC by storm. I mean, I know he's Dana White's, one of Dana White's favorite fighters, and that really says something, because Dana watches, well, almost as much footage as I do. And the other thing that I want to talk about, I mean, he's on a 12-fight win streak, but the only loss on his record is a, is a two-round split decision in a tournament that he fought in, in Japan it's a like long time ago. Fight it was Yeah, it something. was his third. So, for me, I can, I can disregard that to an extent. Okay. When, when, the, when it's a split decision over two rounds, I mean, really, it could be a coin toss if it's a close fight. Okay. So, this kid is effectively untouchable at the moment. I mean, he's on such a roll, and he's got, like I said, he's got weird power. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll show you. <laughs> but Cub Swanson is a little revitalised. I can't remember where I was, but I, I shared breakfast with Cub Swanson. Uh, it wasn't that long ago when he was thinking about hanging up his gloves. He had mm. the broken jaw, I think, for the second time. Yeah. But he's since gone back and realised a few things, maybe mentally or, or strategically even, or both and has looked fantastic since then. Yeah. I think he's got eight performance bonuses in 19 Zufa bouts. Yeah. 
I'm sure that's he's why one, he's one of my favourites. favourites as well. <laughs> exactly. It cost um, him some money though. But that's why he's one of my favourites because he's he always he always comes to fight. There's never a there's never a strategic approach from Cub Swanson. It's I'm gonna take you out or I'm gonna lose trying. <laughs> you know, and I just I love those fighters. You know, go out on your shield. That's what it's about. You yeah, know, you can, you're gladiators. always going to watch him. Always going to watch him. Well, let, let's see what you have picked out from both of these outstanding athletes. <sighs> okay, let's start with Cub Swanson. A few things that I love about Cub Swanson, obviously his striking style, but he's got these real dynamic takedowns as well. Watch how he hops across. Beautiful there. It's Harold really Goshi, nice. Lovely. And watch the slow mo. Watch how he launches him. Now, very good at Dennis Seaver. I will. I will point this out. He goes to reach down with his left hand and then immediately pulls it away, realizing his shoulder would be He's in, in danger. Trouble. Yeah, it, it's it's good work. And then comes once again here. Poirier catches a knee. Beautiful double leg there. And then he goes into a nice lateral drop again. And Poirier is not an easy man to take down or hold down. And, and Swanson did a great job in that fight. And this is something else that's going to be really useful. Duho Choi stands very heavy on his lead leg. And what you'll notice Swanson do is he targets, he doesn't target the outside thigh very often, he, he comes really low. He likes to target the, the, the outside of, the, of, the, thigh, of the, uh, the calf muscle because not only does it damage and bruise and, and make stepping and pushing off very difficult, but it can also strip the base away. And, and if you stand very heavy on that lead leg to invest in the right hand like Choi does, by taking away that lead leg, you can cause all kinds of problems. And he's good in a follow-up scramble. So when that Great. happens, he's got momentum. Exactly. Well, we'll see that here, actually. We'll see, we'll see the follow-up because he... So he's going to throw the outside low kick, chops uh, Kawajiri <laughs> down, then he immediately starts pitching fastballs at him. <laughs> really good work. And you'll see it in the next clip as well. He uses it against Diaz. Watch this. Outside low, left hook, inside low. Really good combination nice. because he upsets the balance he lands a really solid left hook and then he throws the inside low kick just to take away an extra level of base. And even in a scramble here, that unpredictability can generate power from anywhere, lifts his leg up and cracks Diaz, who is a very tough fighter. And against Siva, you can see this big power, hands down, big swings, but finds the target. And this single punch knockout of, of Charles Liriero was just absolutely beautiful. Watch this, this has got to be a fractured orbital bone or something. Wings over the top, almost a oh, straight arm yeah. as he throws it. Cracks him right in the temple, and you can see the expression on Oliveira's face. Yeah. Just drops, just takes, takes his legs away. There was nothing Oliveira could do there. And, and it's, a, it's a statement to Cub Swanson's single punch power. But when he starts that flow, when he starts those big swinging punches, he only needs to land one in a five or six punch combination, and it will change the fight entirely. And that's exactly what happened with Siva. I mean, he lost the first round against Seaver. He got taken down and pinned, and he slowly managed to find his way back into the fight because he's tenacious. Yeah. You know, he's got that athlete, that fighter mentality where he will come at you all the time until you knock him out. One of my favourites. And I, I, I might get this wrong. I'm sure I'll be told. I think the only time he's been knocked out is Jose Aldo. Yeah, the knee. The knee. The that knee. Was, that, and that was back in WEC days. That was quite a while ago. That was a while. And that ago. was a level change onto a knee. And that's Aldo just being special. You know, it's one of those things. Yeah. So a massive statement from Duho Choi saying that he's going to get rid of Swanson in the first round. But this kid has like fighter pilot accuracy. Yes. But yeah. It's, and it's a and ridiculous it, way that he generates power. And he's so unassuming. That's the thing about him. And, and I think that even though fighters have seen his record, they've seen his win streak, they've seen the knockouts that he's had, even in the UFC, there's still, there's still a point in their head where they don't quite accept that he's as powerful as he is. And I'll point out this in a second, but let's, let's start with his debut. Now, this was 18 seconds. He came straight into the UFC. Again, I'm sure most people looked at him and thought, this guy's going to get eaten alive. <laughs> and watch this. Watch how he leans heavy on his front leg, though. Very heavy on his front leg, but big power in his right hand. And as soon as he lands, he doesn't let you off. You know, he's, he's, he's good at keeping the pressure on, but in his second fight against Sam Cecilia, we saw him land a knockdown early in the fight. Beautiful knockdown here. Left hook to the, the side of the ear. Sam Cecilia, a very, very tough individual, manages right. to find his way back into the fight just for a few seconds, and Choi was able to catch him again. But watch this balance here. In the trade, he lands a couple of good shots. They're going to clinch, and then Cecilia is going to try and take him down. But watch this. Beautiful balance, and then immediately circles around to the front headlock. And this is one thing I want to point out to you. He, he's very good at positioning himself to break on his terms. So right here, he's got the front headlock on Sam Cecilia. But one thing he's also done is he's adjusted his other hand, so he's controlling the chin with his left hand, but he's positioned his right hand on the lat. Okay. 
So, it, so he's, 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 he's controlling when this fight is going to break. Rather blocking a knee or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Yeah. What he's going to do here, as soon as he releases this, he can push away and be ready. And it's just, it's just a, it's a very conscious approach to what he's doing. Because he can push away and he immediately yeah, creates space. As you say, he's trying to set things up that he can do. Exactly. And finds a way to land clean, powerful shots. Now, I love that, just stands with his hands on his hips. <laughs> This is the fight that really surprised me because Thiago Tavares is a very tough individual, a strong grappler with a great ground game. Now, he got taken down twice in this. Great reaction time on the sprawl, but just the strength of Tavares was too much for him. But he stayed calm. He was able to get back to his feet. Now, watch this. This, this is Thiago Tavares going, I took him down twice. Let me just catch my breath and I'll go for another takedown. What's he going to do? He's not going to hurt me. Surely he's not going to hurt me. Is he not going to hurt you? He's going to pick you up with a couple of shots, and then he's going to find a right hand right through your guard that's going to make you put your ass on the canvas. Oh, Beautiful. Bounced him. Just, just weird power. It's almost supernatural power because it doesn't, it, it doesn't come from anywhere. There's no big wind up to it. It's just like, poof, and he's hitting with a kettlebell and they're down. <laughs> it, it's fascinating to watch. And really, I mean, at 25, the sky's the limit for this kid. It, yeah. It's a good litmus test to face Cub Swanson, who's been in there with some of the best in the world and has held his own. So now if Duho Choi can step up and do what he's, gonna, what he's saying he's going to do, stop him in the first round, immediately the whole featherweight division goes, OK, let's keep an eye on this kid. Yeah. He's for real. Yeah. His coaches are very excited about him. Apparently he's mm. really easy to coach, and I, I think he's settled around all of the other great fighters, a, a team, Busan, Mad Busan. Yes. Yeah, they, yeah, they've got a, a crazy map there, so... That is a mouth-watering fight as well. Fascinating. <laughs> but we're not done for the year. No, of course. We have more. And Loads let's take a look more. at that. Because we will be back looking at fights oh. for UFC 207. Nunez Rousey for the bantamweight title. We all saw it at UFC 205. Rousey came in and checked straight back out. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's interesting. The bantamweight title there, yeah. Cruz Garbrand. That's oh. well. This, I mean, this is the battle of the bantamweights. That's what jumps off the off the page to me. Obviously, great to see Rousey back, taking on Nunez, who is a, a scary champion. It's going to be very difficult to get the belt from her. Um, it, even for Ronda Rousey, who's very proven, Nunez is so tough. I'm looking forward to getting into that one. Cruz Garbrand obviously is a fantastic fight. Garbrandt bringing the power, Cruz bringing the footwork and the volume. The history between the two exactly. camps as well. You know, all the drama with the alpha fail and all the you know great trash talking yeah. between them and very genuine as well. I mean, these guys aren't joking. And then we drop slightly down the card and we've got Dillashaw taking on Lineker. Lineker just, well, hands of stone. Yeah. Another one of my favourites to watch. He was fighting Dillashaw, who really, for me, was the upgrade of Cruz's footwork. He just didn't, he wasn't able to get it to come to play in the actual fight with Cruz, but he knows he knows that he's on an uneven footing with Cruz, and he knows that a couple of, well, even one win here is going to get him back in that title shot, which is exactly what he wants. And he's spent a little bit more time up in Denver as well. A so bit we more should, settled. Yeah, and, yeah, that could be very exciting. Yeah. Lovely stuff. Well, that is that, Dan. And that is all from us for this show. Remember to get involved in the comment section below and on Twitter using the hashtag inside the octagon keep your eyes peeled for our offerings ahead of ufc 207 but for now all eyes are on toronto and the interim featherweight title bout between max holloway and anthony pettis for now it's goodbye from us ladies and gentlemen this fight is for the interim featherweight championship oh. he's a dangerous man nine straight for max holloway he has dynamic striking he ran off the wall Showtime! This is gonna get crazy. Cerrone. Matt Brown! Oh my goodness! Swanson. Joy! Wow! Look how crazy this main card is.